up in a spare room <laughs> at Wellspring Church, uh, working on um, the ABLE project. Yep. We're talking about worship today, yeah. one of the attend disciplines. I thought we might start by just grounding it in the arc of salvation sure. history and biblical in the yeah, biblical yeah. story. For sure, yeah. So I just even again going back to the very beginning of the book of Genesis, sure. when we see the creation story, Genesis one, it's a seven yeah. day cycle, right? Yeah. And that pattern of seven days of God doing stuff on seven days is really important. Yeah. And it frames it in the sense that all of creation is like a ta tabernacle or a temple. Yeah. Which this, you might miss if you haven't read it or yeah. if you've read it and you're just sort of looking at it through one lens. That actually this is meant. In the ancient Near East, yes. this is a way of signaling that all of creation is God's temple. God's temple where God's presence permeates all of it. And all of creation as a response is meant to worship yeah. God, the center of this yeah. whole thing. So Genesis 1 is signaling yeah. to the, in the ancient Near East, this is a temple picture yes. of all of creation worshiping God. Yes, exactly. And on day six of that seven day cycle, God creates humans in his image yeah. to image God, to represent God. Yeah. And in the sense, N.T. Wright talks about it, image of God in the sense where we're like angled mirrors, where we're on one level to sum up all the praises of creation to God, to have our lives oriented to that vertical worship yeah. of God, but then at the same time to reflect horizontally back out into the world, wow. the goodness and beauty and truth of God to the, right, the, wat, the wider world. And so that's where humans come into this picture yeah. of being these creatures that are partners with God, made in God's yeah. image, not only to worship God vertically, but to <laughs> spread that out horizontally as well. And we see this in particular, yeah. Genesis 2.15 speaks of the human vocation in the garden to work and to keep yeah. in the garden. And that same language, yeah. that pair of words, work and keep, is later used in the tabernacle and temple of what the priests would do in their yeah. service, in their worship. So the priest was actually called to to basically work and keep in the temple or in tabernacle. the temple exactly yes. and so again now we have this temple tabernacle creation yes. mix so they all kind of intersect and bleed together yeah. and so humans in their vocation are to and we kind of say this sometimes even in our day their whole life is to be a life of worship yeah. that work and keep aspect That's gets good. at that uh, what happens though is genesis 3 comes into the story and this is where the traditionally the fall takes yeah. place or where it does take place and so what you have here is humans now, instead of ascribing worth to God, choosing God, trusting God, mm -hmm. worshiping God, they're choosing for themselves. Yeah. So maybe just sort of a quick breakdown of the word worship oh, yeah. in English comes from worthship or ascribing one their due worth. Exactly, yeah. And so worship, so in Genesis 3, what you see is they start ascribing more worth to the snake's words, yeah. to their own preferences, what they see with their eyes exactly. versus who God is. And not trusting what God has previously said. We've talked about that yeah. before. And so what then happens though, Genesis 3 onward, is you have this sort of back and forth. It's this tragedy and the faithfulness yeah. intermix where sometimes humans, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so on and so forth, they choose, they trust, they're yeah. worshiping God. Other times they're not doing so their own thing. Yeah. And so this is tension is at play who will humans worship? Yeah. Who will we worship? Yeah. Will we ascribe that worth to God or kind of go our own and way? And it really hits ahead, I think, in the beginning of the Exodus. Yeah. When God says, you know, he, he's trying to call them out from serving yes. or worshiping yes. uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh to then serve and worship him. Exactly. Because one of the main things about the Exodus story is it's not just freedom. God's setting his people free for freedom's sake. Yeah. It's freedom so that they may worship. All throughout the early chapters of the book of Exodus, yeah. God is saying, let my people go, quote, so that they may worship yep, or totally. serve me. Yeah. And so that's the goal. The goal yeah. is worship. The goal is that intimacy and that relational uh, connection with and then him. And we have that picture yes. in Exodus 14 and 15 that really gets us. Yes, and this is the crossing of the Red Sea. Exodus 14 is yeah. the actual kind of narrative prose of them crossing the Red Sea. God splits the waters. The Egyptian army is uh, drowned in the Red Sea. Exodus 15 yeah. is the first full worship song we get in Scripture. Wow. And so what I love about Exodus 14 and 15, them being side by side, is we see on one hand, Exodus 14 is sort of like the theology, the accounting yeah. of what happened, the narrative, the yeah. history, if you will. But then 15 is the response. Is, is the response. And so yeah. I think this gives us a picture into what worship is to be. It's our response to who God is yeah. and what God has done wow. and describing that worth That's due cool. to his name like you talked about. Yeah. And I think for me, Exodus 15, I would encourage people, if you can, go read yeah. through that, meditate on that. It's a beautiful song of praise of, as again, who God is yeah. and what God um, has and that's done. that's the human response. Worship is the yes, human yes. response 
to who God is and what he's done. Exactly. And particularly, you see that in Exodus. In Exodus 14 and 15 yeah. in particular. Now, again, this, that, this tension of faithfulness or, and yeah. worship to God and or choosing their own way, worshiping oneself, continues to kind of roll sure. out through the rest of the Old Testament. And really, as you get to you know, David and the Psalms in yeah. particular, again, we have more examples of song and worship yeah. being displayed in yeah, the, in the, the book Psalms. Yeah, because the Psalms are prayers and songs yes. that can be, then many of them were sung as worship songs. Yeah, and many of them were meant to be recited yeah. as songs, as kind of in corporate gatherings or even in one's own personal prayer yeah. and worship life, yeah. uh, for sure. One of the other things I'm struck by, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, is uh, these moments when people encounter God. So I think of mm. like Isaiah, oh, he has yeah, this yeah. vision of God and angels. Yeah. And it's fascinating to me what angels are doing, right? They're singing. Yeah. They're singing, holy, oh holy, holy. And you have this sense of they're ascribing worth yeah. to God. They're worshiping him. And you have this sort of picture in the Hebrew Bible of the future destiny yes. of all things. Yeah. Where all worth is going to be ascribed to God. For sure. And, yeah. and I think that's really key because as you read through the prophets, you see that theme replayed over and over and over again of the prophets calling the people of God yeah. to reorient their minds and their yeah. hearts and their bodies back to worshiping God and not after all these sort of Good. false idols and things that are yeah. leading them astray. Now, when Jesus comes onto this yeah. scene, I think this is really important because God's people are in a time of longing and anticipation, longing for God to come. Mm. Jesus comes as the embodiment of yeah. God and comes into Nazareth, first century Galilee. And he is constantly in this mode. We've talked about it with prayer a little yeah. bit too, but he is worshiping. He, yeah. as a faithful Jew, would have attended synagogue yeah. on a regular basis. That would have been normal. Expected, normal for him. Like, very odd not to make it every week. Totally, exactly. And you'd be singing the Psalms. Psalms, exactly. So Tim Keller talks about the, the Psalms being, and other people have talked about yeah. this too, being like the prayer and song book yeah. of Jesus. And I think totally. that's just kind of a cool way of thinking about that. Uh, but for me, one story that really pops yeah. out in particular with Jesus as it relates to worship is... Jesus and his interaction with the woman in John chapter 4, the Samaritan, the woman at the well. The wellspring. The wellspring. There you go, right? <laughs> the origins of wellspring right there from scripture. But what you have in John 4 is that kind of, it's a semi-famous story, yeah. but Jesus is dialoguing with this woman at the well. And there's a couple things that yep. just quickly want to point out is that Jesus, he speaks to the Samaritan woman and says to her. So she's not Jewish. Not she's Jewish. Samaritan. That's important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he says to her, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. And so what I think Jesus is getting at, this is four, chapter 4, verse 22. What Jesus is getting at is that our knowledge yeah. does matter. Our yeah. theology does matter. Our doctrine of God does yeah. matter. Who we think about and what we think about as far as who we're worshiping, yeah. all of that matters. So I don't want to just reduce worship to mind and theology, yeah. Yeah. but I think there is a place for that. Yeah. And it, it is not necessarily, it's not a mindless experience. Exactly, yes. It takes context in a story. Yes. In beliefs. For sure. In convictions. Yes, all those things are super important. And so Jesus is, I think, saying that the object of our worship matters greatly. Yeah, and the good. knowledge of that object, yeah. God himself, uh, matters greatly. But then also the manner of our worship. Jesus then says that God is seeking worshipers. So just really briefly here, that's plural. Yeah. This He's is community. looking for worshipers. worshipers. Exactly. It's He's, a fascinating idea. It's a idea. crazy idea, right? But again, this is, yeah, for sure. Personal worship, 110% yeah. matters for sure. But also the communal aspect yeah. as well matters yeah. greatly as, as well. But he's saying, Jesus does goes on to say that he's looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit in and in truth. And I think both of those kind of go together where mm. on the spirit side you have the experience, the yeah. emotional side. The encounter. The encounter side, the yeah. awe, the intimacy, all of that. Isaiah and falls on his face. Exactly. Yeah. The, the bodily responses. But then you also have the truth side. Again, the That's doctrine good. side. Yeah. And so one of my favorite theologians, he says this about this kind of this interplay between experience and theology and worship. Theology without worship is empty but worship without theology is blind. Wow. And so that's where I think both matter. I think that's something that's I just good. want to advocate uh, for that. And at the base of all this is because this is, God is our creator. God is the one who is both spirit and truth yeah. and is calling us and desiring us that's to cool. worship. So. It, uh, when you said that quote, it reminded me of what Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew oh, yeah, 15, yeah. 8, 9. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain mm. do they worship. Yeah, yeah me yeah. right so you have this sense in which you can sing all the right songs yeah your theology can be right totally but you can worship in vain mm. because your heart your heart yeah is far exactly um you know and it sort of gets me back you know as revelation unfolds right you start to see these 
pictures again, these windows oh, yeah, yeah. into what the kingdom of God is going to be like when Jesus returns. And you have these pictures of angels saying, you know, worthy is the Lamb. Yes, yeah. You have this sort of effective sense of like their heart yeah. is aligned with their words. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then you also have this picture, right, towards the end of the scriptures where you start to have this sort of all the nations, all the nations are gathering. Totally, yeah. You have this aspect, I love this, where the Lamb, Jesus, is at the center, he's yeah. on the throne. And people, the book of Revelation says, John has this vision. Every people from every tribe, tongue, and nation yeah. are gathered around Jesus yeah. at the center, worshiping him. And this speaks to this fact that worship in God's heart and desire is to be multi-ethnic. Yeah. I would say multi-ethnic and like across time. Across time. Right? Like I think this is another thing we sometimes, yeah, yeah. multi-ethnic. Yes. 100%. Amen. 100%. But also they're not going to all be 21st century yeah. people. And they're not going to all be millennials. They're not going to all be like all across ages. Yeah. Everything. All kinds of generational. 100%. Like, millennial assumptions. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Totally. And then this is what's beautiful about this is that at the center is Jesus. So worship in the book of Revelation, really throughout all scripture, yeah. is this unifying experience in truth. Yeah. Where it's, especially in our cultural moment, really throughout a lot of human history, yeah. humanity has been so divided on across yeah. a number of issues. But for us today here at Wellspring in our local church here, yeah. to have worship be this beautiful unifying thing where yeah. Jesus is at the center, That's what's good. uniting us all is our worship, our worship of him, yeah. who he is and what he's done That's for good. us. That's good. So then, Going from biblical theology, this sort of scriptural yeah. arc to your life yeah, yeah. today, what have you found helpful? What would you suggest for, for people? For sure. Like yeah, I think, again, for me, it really comes down to worship being something I really do enjoy. I'm not musically inclined yeah. at all, but the moments for me, so I kind of, I'm trying to do this thing of as I'm studying, because I love to read and mm -hmm. study, also having moments of song. So song and study yeah. for me, I'm trying to integrate and have those work That's together good. where my mind is being challenged and also the affections in my yeah. heart are also being shaped and formed, awakened, yeah. exactly. And so practically what this means for me, again, I don't have a guitar, I can't play an instrument. <laughs> I tried piano lessons and then I quit at like, yeah. you know, I was in second grade or yeah, something. Yeah, I was gonna say, you're okay. <laughs> Yeah, too young. <laughs> I really regret that though as a, as a side you thing. You can still learn. Yeah, I know, totally. But for me, I'm just, I'm just stuck with Spotify yeah, at this point. But what, I, and it really does, it really has yeah. brought beautiful encounters with God in That's worship. Cool. And I think, whether, however that might look for people, it's taken me a little bit of time to find a certain mm. playlist or artist yeah. or songs just to kind of curate some it of resonate. that. That resonate, which exactly. is okay. Totally, yeah. And I think you know, I, I, I want to be part of the effective thing about song and exactly. worship is it can be. And then you're talking about multi-ethnic, right? Oh yeah, like. People connect to different, different types of music. Totally. And not to be ashamed of that. culture, whatever, preference, like that's for okay. For sure. Yeah. And so for me, I have a few different playlists that I kind of have, and then I'll, I'll alternate between study and worship. Sometimes I'll even go for a walk with, yeah. you know, some of these songs. That's but cool. that's for me, I think, one of the ways that this really gets fleshed out that's cool. in my life. So Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, I resonate with that too, particularly the song side, mm -hmm. um, just listening to music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would just resonate with is that like, I just think sometimes worship can be very emotionally focused. Mm. Uh, so I try and sort of balance that out with sort of worship for me really being centered on sort of a, I don't know, a cruciform, yeah. pick up your cross submission. Yeah. That like one of the central pieces for me with worship is that I'm laying down my life yeah. Yeah. in submission to Jesus. For sure. Right, uh, Romans uh, 12, run, right? Offer your bodies yeah. as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice, that's yeah. a very loaded worship For sure. word. Yeah. Uh, right, and you're, you're giving yourself over to God, mm -hmm. not just your words, but all of your life. Yeah. Um, I think for me, those are the two. So certainly I think incorporating, like if I was gonna advise someone, you know, certainly start listening to some music. Oh, yeah. There's some good music. Come every Sunday to oh, worship. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Huge. Um, there's you can't really replace Spotify. Is not the same oh, as embodied 100%, 100%, corporate worship. Yeah. Especially without masks. Yeah, totally. And um, yeah, and then also sort of this idea of worship as just laying our lives down yeah, before Jesus. For sure. I think that's great. I just want to hundred percent echo that corporate aspect. Hundred and ten percent for sure yeah. is so vital. So yeah. being a part with other believers worshiping God. It's one of the few instances in our even culture, generally speaking, where people are gathered together singing yeah. in one voice. It's yeah. a beautiful thing to be cool. a part of. So Sounds good. Cool.